After driving for miles, our determined mother spots a ramshackle shed, which she takes an immediate fancy to. Not having a pot to piss in, or even a window to throw it out of, Marlacy's not in the best of bargaining positions. But Mr. Moon, the lonely landowner, takes pity on her and offers her the land in exchange for her labours around his house and nursery. Look at this place. It takes a lot of work. How do I know you won't just up and run off someday? Well, if I did that, then you'd have all that free labor plus your land back. But I'm telling you something, Mr. Moon. If you sell me that land, I'm building me and my kids a house we ain't ever leaving. At least not while I'm still breathing. Life is hard for the Lacey family. It's months before they get windows and even longer before indoor plumbing arrives. But Mother refuses to take charity from anyone. So driven is she by her desire to build her dream house, she completely forgets about the children's needs, the final straw being their first disastrous Christmas. Their presents for our house. Remember? We talked about it. This is not a house. It's not Christmas. More TV movie than anything else, a home of our own sounds an outmoded moral message in a curiously half-hearted way. Cynical I may be, but if this is the 60s version of the dysfunctional family, give me the 90s version any day. Also growing up in the 60s were the Sandlot kids, who had an altogether much happier time of it than the Lacey kids. 11-year-old Scotty and his mum and stepdad have just arrived in Salt Lake City. Meeting the local gang, he's introduced to the finer points of baseball, the only problem being he can't catch. Listen to me, Smalls. It's the matter of life and death. Where did your old man get that ball? What? I don't know. Some lady gave it to him. Why? What? Uh, lady? Lady? Yeah, she even signed her name on it. Some lady named Ruth. Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth! <laughs> When one of the boys hits the ball over the fence, Scotty is prevented from retrieving it on account of the huge fire-breathing monster lurking beyond, an obstacle they're all determined to face like men. You gotta get that ball back. Just a little bit further. <laughs> With echoes of Stand By Me, but lacking that film's integrity, Sandlot Kids is an optimistic coming of age, reeking of nostalgia and a lament for lost innocence, which will always be the stuff of little boys' dreams. Sticking with the dreamers, it's over to the battle of the animators. Whilst ex-Disney mogul Jeffrey Katzenberg and mega-director Steven Spielberg are currently building cartoon empires in the sky stateside, this month sees the release of Spielberg's latest animated entity, We're Back. And now in my golden years, I'm trying to give something back. It's a wish radio. I can hear what people are wishing for, especially young people, because they wish the loudest. Produced at Amblimation, Spielberg's West London animation empire, this jolly tale transports more of those prehistoric pets into the present day, this time via a wishing machine, which allows them to make everyone's dreams come true. Can you fly? <laughs> Next, ex-Disney animator Don Bluth breathes new life into an old story with his version of Hans Christian Andersen's Thumbelina. Desperate to find a miniature mate, Thumbelina goes in search of love, which she discovers in the shape of fairy prince Cornelius, who naturally falls head over heels in love with her and asks her to marry him. Let me be your wings, let me be your only love. But before her prince can claim her heart, she's kidnapped by Mrs. Dolores Toad, who wants her to marry her ugly son. No prince hiding behind this frog, I'm afraid. Why don't you just nab this prince and you set up a trap for the girl, using him as the bait? You know, get her to come to you. Escaping her ugly suitor by the skin of her teeth, our pint-sized princess's problems are only just beginning, since simply everyone she meets wants to marry her. Happens to me all the time. But as with all good fairy tales, our little heroine is determined to follow her heart, and nothing will stop her getting her prince. You're sure to do impossible 
covered with songs from Barry Manilow, Thumbelina is a charming and well-executed tale, but it's still not a patch on my favorite an American tale. I still think Spielberg and Bluth have got an awful lot further to go before they're ready to challenge Disney's hegemony. Watch this space. You've seen the movie, read the book, bought the shirt, and now there's the audio book. Yes, look, no hands. You can now listen to Jurassic Park, Clear and Present Danger, Forrest Gump, Interview with the Vampire, and even Kenneth Branagh's brand new bedtime story, Frankenstein, in the car, in the bath, or on your Walkman. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. Though the audio book market has been around for some time, it's through movie tie-ins that companies are hoping to ensnare a brand new audience. After all, movie spin-offs have the potential to be bigger than the films themselves these days. Although the UK market is still dominated as yet by the BBC, book and video publishers are moving rapidly into this new area. Take Simon & Schuster, for example, the Paramount-owned company with a ready-made film library at their fingertips. What movies do for um, audio tapes and books as well is basically give them an enormous amount of marketing muscle and publicity. The, the marketing budgets on films are absolutely enormous by our standards. We have these tiny little budgets. We can't possibly give a product such a push as something like Forrest Gump or Clear and Present Danger has had. This means that um, what is an unfamiliar product, very few people, a lot of people are wary about audio. They're slightly snobby about it. Um, but what it does is gives it the, the crucial familiarity. If they've seen the big posters of Tom Hanks sitting on the bench um, and they see it on the, the front of a book or in the front of a tape, that is obviously going to reassure them that this is, this is a genuine, genuine article. I just run as fast as I could across the practice football field, and suddenly I seen Coach Spellers setting up in the bleachers, watching me. We'd run a lot of races before to see how fast we could run, but I get a lot faster when I'm being chased. What idiot wouldn't? The way that um, these things are cast, often the reader is given the first, the, the author is given the first refusal. Um, for instance, Winston Groom was very keen to read Forrest Gump, and it works very well because it's written in a colloquial style. It's written effectively as he speaks, and in, and this is why this is what makes it strong on on tape, in my opinion. Meanwhile, Bubba and me, we has got us a plan for when we get out of the army. We're gonna go back home and get us a shrimp boat and get in the shrimping business. Bubba come from Bile of Battery and worked on shrimp boats all his life. He say maybe we can get us a loan and we can take turns at being captain and all and we can live on the boat and we'll have something to do. Well, the advantage of, of film tie-ins is, as I've said, they're very, a very good introduction to other programs. At the moment in the UK, it's very difficult to sell n normal fiction in any large numbers because people still uh, still are wary. They still just buy the book or they wait for the paperback. What, what film tie-ins offer is a a way into the sort of the multimedia, the multimedia sort of world that is that is reassuring. If a film has been made of a book, then it's somehow all right for an audio to be made as well. To some people, it now seemed Oscar was spending like a compulsive gambler. Even from the little they knew of him, his prisoners could sense that he would ruin himself for them if that was the price. Later, not now, for now they accepted his mercies in the same spirit in which a child accepts Christmas presents from its parents. They would say, thank God he was more faithful to us than to his wife. And in our second competition tonight, we've got Frankenstein, Forrest Gump, Clear and Present Danger, Schindler's List, and Star Trek, talking book cassettes to give away. If you can tell me whose famous saying was, I want to tell you a story. Was it A, Max Bygraves? B, Bruce Forsyth, or C, Des O'Connor. Phone in on 0891665566 to leave your answer. Winner of 1949's Best Foreign Film Oscar comes Vittoria De Sica's The Bicycle Thieves. Hailed as one of cinema's all-time classics, this simple tale of everyday life in post-war Rome features a cast of non-professional actors and real locations. So impressed was Hollywood with the movie that David O. Selznick offered to produce to Sicker's next movie, complete with stellar cast. He quite naturally refused. 
So was the film really that good, or has it aged badly? The viewers panel decide. Hi, it's an enormous pleasure for us to be back on The Little Picture Show. Just to remind you, I'm Charles. I'm Mary. And this is Mrs. Mouse, the movie buff. We've been watching Bicycle Thieves, such an all-time classic of the European cinema that we wouldn't dare say a word against it. Fortunately, we're not even tempted to. The story. It's set in the most dismal slums of Rome in 1948. The hero, if we can call him that, is an unemployed bill sticker who finally, to the absolute joy of the whole family, gets himself a job. Yes, he gets himself a job, but in order to do this job, he must have a bicycle. He goes down to the pawnbroker, where his own bicycle is, and he redeems it. Papa, ha visto che ci hanno fatto? Che ci hanno fatto? Una maccatura. Che ce lo fa? Magari c'era. No, non c'era. Questa è una botta che gli hanno dato. Chissà come le tengono. Io gli avrei detto. Mi cari di parte, mi riparazioni. Ma te vuoi sta zitto? Sì, mi sto zitto. He cycles off for his first day's work. He's taught how to stick up the posters. He goes off to do it on his own. He's up his ladder, posting a poster. And what happens? The bike is stolen. He's in absolute despair. And the rest of the film is devoted to showing him with his little son searching the city in a, an attempt to recover the bike. They go everywhere, to all the poorest parts of the city, searching, searching, searching for this bicycle, searching among thousands of bicycles. We see all the poorest parts of Rome. We see the people who live there. These aren't sets, these are real locations. These aren't actors, these are real people. The rain that falls on them is real rain. It's an example of neo-realism, which was a reaction against the phony glamour and glitz of the fascist era. But that doesn't mean to say that it's dead gloomy. And the fact that not an awful lot happens shouldn't put you off either. At the heart of this film is this relationship between the father and the son. Little boys in movies can be incredibly yucky and schmaltzy and horrid, but not this one. Absolute simplicity and honesty. Very gripping. There's no sentiment, and it's phenomenally well acted. And the emotion is enhanced by a brilliant yeah. musical score and by the most fantastic art photography. Yeah. 